The equity market pain continues live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market negative 1% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, slower but higher. Don't focus on the pace anymore. There's a shift in narrative. Yes, it's about the destination, not the journey. There were two bombshells, really. The beginning of the Fed meeting and the statement itself was misleading. The first one is we're not pausing. We have ways to go before we actually can pause. The second bombshell is suddenly more hawkish tone. Chair Paul is more concerned about under-tightening than over-tightening. This was a big disappointment for the market. The Fed does not want to see a replay of what we saw in July. The main thing for me is a new narrative. If we're past the catch-up phase. Now it's about the ultimate destination. You're expected to see a step up in that SEP statement uh, for the terminal rate. The market is love guessing where this terminal rate is. Let's get that conversation started. Joining us now is Black Rocks Gaki Chowdhury, Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College. Gaki, first to you. OK, slower but higher. How much higher? Good morning, John. Great to be here. Um, so they made it very clear yesterday, or at least at the press conference, they made it very clear yesterday that uh, that we haven't seen the peak in Fed funds rate uh, based on their SCP forecast in September. It's still going to move higher. I would imagine that when we get the dots the next time in December, that points to perhaps 4.8 or 5 percent. And I think the market will and already has started beginning to price in something even higher than that. And I think it's fair to say that we'll probably see perhaps even a 5.2 getting priced into the peak Fed funds rate. In September, the 23 dot went from 380 to 460. Krishna, when they meet again in December and come out with new projections, where's that dot going to be? Well, so they have been uh, somewhat incremental in that approach, and uh, the fact that they are slowing the pace down probably indicates that they want to be incremental. So I think 5% is a good number to work with. Having said that, I think, uh, to his credit, Jay Powell was very clear. He has no clue what the terminal rate is going to be. So for this meeting, for this SAP, we can get uh, to 5%, but if the data continues to be as strong, it's probably higher. We are not pricing it that uh, at that level just yet, but that cannot be ruled out at the moment based on the, what we are seeing in the real data. Yields are up right now by 11 basis points on a two-year to 473. City and Vasilios Janakis came out during the news conference just after it and said this, I can't see how U.S. yields can stop increasing. He went on to say Powell's message to the market effectively was reprice the terminal rate higher and price out any rate cuts for next year. Their view on a two-year Gargi is that the two-year can hit 5% before year-end. They say it's unequivocally dollar bullish. You've seen that play out in the FX market today. If you just compare what you heard from Chairman Powell yesterday to Governor Bailey this morning, one wants the terminal rate higher, the other one is pushing back against rate pricing. Cable right now is down 2% to 111.64. I'll get to the dollar piece in just a moment. Let's start with the front end. Gargi, a two-year at 5%, not a long, long way away from where we are right now. Do you think we can get there pretty quickly? You're right. Not a long run way away at all, especially given what we heard from the Fed yesterday. Can we get there? Yes. I believe that now. I didn't uh, even about a month and a half ago. Can we get there? Yes. But is that what is actually going to realize? Are we actually going to be happy that we bought that two-year yield at 5%? I think the answer to that is also yes. Because at the end of the day, even if the markets start pricing in this uh, terminal at five, five and a quarter, I don't actually think they'll deliver all of that because they've already opened the window, like slightly, ever so slightly, to this concept of needing to slow the pace. We're nowhere near a pause. We're nowhere near a pivot. All of that is far, far away, but they will slow the pace. And ultimately, this idea that the economy is going to slow down as a reaction to this very high terminal rate will have to be something that the Fed contends with. And we're seeing that, as you said, from the Bank of England already. So yes, to your answer, it could maybe go there. But I think that continues to be a really good buying opportunity for those looking for coupon. I want to pick up on something you implied. 
which is there is difference, a difference between what they signal and what they'll ultimately do. Now, Krishna, when it comes to the equity market, I just wonder how tradable that is. Let's say we're sitting here now and you've got a chairman trying to guide you towards maybe pricing in 5% as a terminal rate, yet you don't believe they're going to get there because the data is going to do something that basically leads them to back away from that call. Krishna, is that something that you can use to get long equities right now when this chairman is really not interested in seeing equities go higher? Well, I, I think uh, getting long equities at these levels perhaps doesn't make any sense, at least not today, until we see some more data where there is some evidence of some slowdown. Having said that, I think the, the, the thesis has to be probably puts a floor as to how low equities can go. And that kind of gives you uh, an opportunity to leg into the market. So I think if the current situation persists, the likelihood that we go through the 3,500, 3,600 floor remains somewhat uh, somewhat spotty for the, the sort of reasons that Gargi just uh, articulated. Having said that, I think uh, I want to believe what Gargi says. I, I truly do. <laughs> I want to be the optimist. But so far, I see nothing, absolutely nothing. And I am a perennial optimist. That gives me uh, uh, any level of confidence that 5% is it. That's it. That's you know, kind of hanging on DOE to conclude sort of things for the U.S. market, I don't think is, abs is at all appropriate because they are dealing with all sorts of other stuff. And 5% is just a number at the moment. And at the pace we are going, uh, it takes a, a couple more meetings and we may be north of that uh, pretty quickly. Hold up, Krishna. You think the scope for the terminal rate to be priced higher? How much higher? Well, so that's a, that's a very good question. I think the, the trade-off, and, and uh, J. Powell kind of alluded to it, the trade-off that he's saying is uh, basically, you know, get it higher, much higher, and then uh, uh, and not hold it at that level versus get it to a modestly higher level and then hold it at that level. And I think that's the conflict that they're dealing with. And that conflict will be resolved not by what J. Powell thinks. That conflict will only be resolved what the data does. And uh, the, the, the data that he's focusing on is really the savings and the labor side of the equation. And neither of them are showing signs of any significant weakening. As a punting man, you know, you have to go with the data a little bit more than you would like to, but that's a reality today. Gaki, your reaction? Sure. So, you know, I... <laughs> I'd say that the f you're right, 5% is just a number. And I think the market is actually going to price in higher than 5%. But we'll also have to see the other side, the trade-off that Krishna was talking about, playing through in the market. And look, that hasn't happened yet. They themselves talked about the lag in the FOMC statement. Of course, we forgot all about that 30 minutes later. But they did talk about the lag of policies, the lag that is going to eventually show up in the housing market. It already has, if you look at the housing starts data, which has been at the worst declining rate ever, given the pace of uh, mortgage rate rising. It's going to follow through to other parts of the economy. So, so far, the Fed has been singularly focused on inflation at some point, And that point could come in a, a one quarter. It could come in a little bit longer than that. But at some point, they have to think about the impact that's going to have on the housing market and broadly on the labor market. Uh, again, to, my, to Krishna's point earlier, we haven't seen that in the labor market. Thankfully, the labor market is still very strong. But do we really want to have a Fed that is creating job losses of, you know, two, three, five million? I don't think the Fed wants that. And that's why I think eventually, even though the market will and probably can price in a lot higher than 5 percent, they already are, or perhaps even five and a quarter, um, I don't think they'll deliver that. It might not be the Fed we want, but maybe it's the Fed we've got. Right now, futures on the S&P down by about 1 percent on the S&P 500. Yields higher, much, much higher. Some big moves in this market in the last 24 hours. On top of them, Kelly Lines. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, John, you can thank the chairman for that. He essentially, his message yesterday was it's not about the journey and a slower pace of hikes. It's about the ultimate destination, and it's a lot higher than you guys thought back in September. So you better reprice your terminal rate expectations. And that is exactly what we have seen the markets do. Yes, we think we'll reach 5% by March, but by uh, May and later on, we think we're going to be north of 510 and stay north of 5 throughout 2023. So no longer 
Is this just a conversation about potentially cuts next year? It's higher for longer and a higher peak than previously thought. So the short end of the curve does have to re-rate because of that. We are seeing the two-year yield climb again today, up 11 point basis points intraday. We're now north of 472. This is the highest we have seen on the two-year going back to July of 2007. And of course, really no part of the curve is immune to this force today. You are seeing yields higher across maturities. And with higher rates and higher rate expectations, equities taking a pretty hard hit. It was so interesting yesterday to see after the statement released, equity markets really trying to cling to anything dovish and then just getting smacked down by Chairman Powell, who rattled off a list of half a dozen hawkish talking points when he thought the market was still rallying. So as a result, worst Fed day for the S&P since January of 2021 yesterday. Obviously, those losses continuing this morning, and we just see that benchmark trying and failing again to break out of its technical downtrend, John. Kelly Lights, thank you. I think we were all struck by a moment in the news conference yesterday, and I've talked about this a few times, so forgive me if you've already heard this, but I think it's worth revisiting. Right at the very end, Chairman Powell was wrongly misled into believing that the equity market was rallying in response to the Fed decision. And in response to that, he went through point by point all the hawkish talking points from the news conference. And someone messaged me, it was like a hawkish greatest hits from Chairman Powell in response to an equity market that he thought was rallying. And Krishna, it made me think in the last 10 years, don't fight the Fed, men, don't short this market. And it just feels like looking at how that news conference played out, and I thought it was incredibly revealing. In fact, one of the most revealing moments I've seen in a news conference, perhaps ever, that he pushed back that hard against it. Isn't that basically the chairman telling you the rules of the game? That if you think you could be long in this market bullish, I don't want it that way. Well, so I, I think, uh, as somebody said, he Jackson holed us in, in two minutes. Uh, effectively, uh, as you said, he went point by point, uh, uh, making sure that the market got the message really clearly. And the market certainly did get the message really cl clearly. So I think in this environment, it's very hard to be long any risk assets, and perhaps other than you know one year or two year notes, those are not really risk assets, but some, some something that can generate positive returns. Uh, having said that, I think the point is worth remembering. He's on a he's on a mission at the moment based on the data that he's seeing today, and I, I think it is also fair to say that he does not, and the committee itself perhaps does not have a good handle on what the data is going to look like middle of next year. Equity investors, on the other hand, have to contemplate some of that. So that, to me, indicates that given what is going on in any in other parts of the economy other than the labor market, uh, things are softening. So expecting softening down the road is possibly a, a something that can happen, probably will happen. Uh, but kind of taking extended exposure, expecting that today, given what we have to go through over the next few quarters, is somewhat tough. Gargi, if you're long this equity market, are you fighting this Fed? So, as you know, John, we have actually been talking about being defensive in this equity market. We don't think you're supposed to be overweight this equity market at all. Uh, you know, what we're seeing in the earnings, uh, state, uh, earnings season so far, we're seeing that companies have already been revising their earnings guidance all through from the summer all the way now. And when earnings estimates are so low, it, it is easier to beat. But at the same time, as we look forward to Q4, again, earnings estimates are going to come lower. And there's also, again, a lagged effect of the macro headwinds that we're facing with higher rates. There's a macro effect of the higher dollar that we talked about just a second ago and how that feeds into the company bottom lines. We're already seeing that in earnings season this year. So you're supposed to remain defensive on equities. I don't think this is the moment to be buying the dip. But I will say where we do see opportunities is certain sectors within the equity markets. I would say energy has been something that we've been talking about. And again, the earnings season shows us that that continues to be a bright spot in the market. Healthcare is another one, uh, a good place to earn some quality in your portfolio. And, you know, remaining invested in Minval names is something that we like. But certainly not the moment to buy the dip in equity market yet. Gagi Chowdhury, Krishna Mamani, sticking with us. What a news conference that was yesterday. The job of the chairman in a news conference is to reflect the consensus of the committee. I just wonder how together that committee is right now and whether the Fed speak of the next few weeks maybe highlights some, some cracks in the unity 
of the Federal Reserve. Futures right now down nine tenths of one percent on the S&P. Yields absolutely flying at the front end, up 12 basis points, 474 on a two year. Coming up, corporate America's hiring slowdown, gaining momentum. Companies actually have been hiring, making plans. And frankly, the turnover is starting to change and maybe they hired a little too many people too early. That conversation up next. The U.S. has a lot of momentum, especially in the service sector. And we think that's why you know, jobless claims are staying low. We don't think the unemployment rate is going to rise soon. Uh, the momentum in the service sector is going to continue. Uh, the rate hikes are slowing things like housing, uh, but it's not having an impact on services, and we think it'll take a long time to happen. A growing list of companies announcing job cuts or hiring freezes this year. C-suites bracing for an economic slowdown. Morgan Stanley, the latest among them, according to Reuters. The latest round of data painting a different picture with no real change in jobless claims in America. Team coverage starts right now with Kelly Lines and Mike McKee. Mike McKee, first to you. I don't see what I'm hearing from companies in the data. A lot of companies on by that board, but not a lot of people filing for unemployment yet, at least. 217,000 the past week. That's the same as pretty much the same as it was la the week before that. And what's even more interesting is that the continuing claims numbers don't rise significantly. We are not seeing people spend a lot of time on unemployment. Those who do file are finding new jobs reasonably quickly, and that is good news for the economy. Of course, we'll be looking tomorrow to see what's happening with jobs. Do we see a slowdown? The forecast is for 200,000, and unemployment forecast to rise just a little bit. That's going to be interesting to watch. Average hourly earnings maybe step down some. And the interesting news today, productivity is falling still, down 1.4% on an annual basis, but unit labor costs dropped a little bit. So put it all together and maybe Jay Powell's going to get what he wants. Maybe. Just maybe. maybe. Big maybe. Kelly Lyons, this Fed emboldened by the labor market data yeah. Mike's been covering. At the same time, you can just look across the C-suite in corporate America right now. It's crack after crack after crack. Yeah, and maybe the latest is Morgan Stanley. That writer's report saying in the coming weeks they could cut, cut perhaps a small single-digit percentage of their global workforce. We haven't gotten confirmation from the bank on that, but that would kind of jive with what James Gorman hinted on on the earnings call last week. And, of course, Morgan Stanley not alone. Let's talk about Twitter and Elon Musk as well. Could cut half of Twitter's workforce about 3,700 jobs as he tries to cut costs after overpaying $44 billion for the company. And there's more. I literally typed the word layoffs into the headline bar on my Bloomberg terminal, and there was a laundry list just in the last week. Open Door laying off 18% of workers. Galaxy Digital may cut 20%. Qualcomm has frozen hiring. Seagate could cut 3,000 jobs. I could go on, but the point, John, is this is a wave. And PwC released a survey yesterday saying 8 out of 10 human resource officers say they're cutting jobs, freezing hiring, or employing other tactics to reduce staff. So something is going on in corporate America. Maybe the data just doesn't reflect it yet. Kelly Lyons, Mike McKee, thank you. And as Kelly's speaking, this headline, Stripe, cutting staff by 14% as it readies for what they call leaner times. Bob Michael of JP Morgan Asset Management said this yesterday. The markets are priced for a soft landing. They are not priced for a recession. And it's the latter he's expecting, not the former. Krista Mamani, do you agree? Well, yeah, I think the market, if you look at credit spreads, and I look at credit spreads as the ultimate benchmark of uh, recession pricing, they are certainly not pricing, uh, uh, pricing a recession. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a problem. I think if you, if you look at the, the retrenchments that we are talking about, it's coming from sectors like financial services and tech primarily. It's not coming from hotels. It's not coming from restaurants. It's not coming from airlines. And that's where the, you know, that's where the, uh, the labor pressures are really coming from. So, yes, the, there is some softening in the labor market, but it isn't in the sectors that the Fed is really worried about at the moment. So, uh, you know, and, and the, the real test of all of that is really not going to come in the next quarter or probably not till the end of the year. It's really going to come in early part of next year. If there is any softening, that's when we are going to, uh, you know, we, we are going to see it. And so for now, we are basically stuck with the water torture for from now till probably first, uh, late first quarter. It is water torture 
for most people, particularly if they've been long through most of this year. The co-founder of Stripe said the following just moments ago. We were much too optimistic about the internet companies, internet economies, near-term growth in 22 and 23, and underestimated both the likelihood and impact of a broader slowdown. Gargi, we're not seeing this in the aggregate data just yet, the jobs market data. Maybe we see it tomorrow. I don't know. We are seeing the underperformance, though, in places like tech and the outperformance in places like energy. Are there pockets of the market, Gargi, right now, you talked about defensive, but are there pockets of the market that you want to stay in and pockets you want to totally avoid? Sure, John, absolutely. So there are. And I think that we have to first come to terms with the fact that we've we are now at a close to 2% real rate regime, and we're likely to stay there for some time. And that's a big departure from the minus 2 or minus 1% real rate regime that we were at for a long time. And this means something for different parts of the capital stack. And I think investing accordingly, to your point around what just came out from Stripe and looking at some of the earnings that came out from the mega cap tech, I think there is a recognition that's happening that discounting rate at 2% is very different than the minus 1.5%. So what does that mean for you as an investor? I would say look for those pockets of cash flow generation. Look for companies, sectors, and industries that have that. Energy happens to be one. Healthcare providers happen to be another one. And then I would say look for a coupon. Fixed income is giving you high-quality fixed income, such as IGSB, which is front-end investment-grade credit, is earning you 6%. Clip that coupon. Gagi Chowdhury, that's the message from you, alongside Krishna Mamani, to the both of you. Thank you. What a moment for this economy, for central banks and for markets too. Governor Bailey in the Bank of England speaking just moments ago in a news conference, saying that the UK is suffering a bigger income shock than in the 1970s. If you're following cable right now, 111.67, nothing like the 103.50s we saw back at the end of September, but still it's a 2% move negative on the day against sterling in the favour of a stronger US dollar off the back of much higher bond yields, off 11 basis points on a two-year, 4.73. Equity futures lower now on the S&P by one full percentage point. Up next, the morning calls and later, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo anticipating 3Q earnings to see the worst penalties on record. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equity futures down nine tenths on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about one full percentage point. That's the price action. Here's the morning calls. First up, JP Morgan downgrading Corvo to underweight from overweight, highlighting global macro headwinds and bloated inventories. Next up, Rosenblatt downgrading Roku to neutral, expressing concerns about the company's outlook. And finally, KeyBank cutting its Qualcomm price target down to 150, expecting demand and supply challenges to continue after earnings. Coming up on this program, betting on momentum and earnings volatility. That's the call from Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. He joins us at the opening bell. The opening bell just around the corner with futures down nine tenths of one percent. The cash open up next. Twenty-five seconds away from the opening bell this morning. The worst Fed day price action on the S&P since January 2021. That stat for you from Rita Nazareth here at Bloomberg. Futures right now down 1% on S&P 500 futures. On the Nasdaq, we are down by more than 1% again. Negative follow-through here on the equity market. There's the opening bell this Thursday morning. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Payne, the epicenter of it, yields up nine basis points on a 10-year, just south of 420, 419.31. Check out the front end, ugly, up 10 basis points, 472 on a two-year. The highs of the year, the highest since 2007. If you get yields this high, you get some dollar strength. It's biting into the euro, 97.54 on euro dollar, down by six tenths of 1%. It's taken a chunk out of sterling. Cable, 111.75, negative 1.9%. Chairman Powell pushing one way. Governor Bailey trying to lean in the other direction. In crude, 87.98, we're down by more than 2%. That's the cross-asset price action. Here's the open for you. About 35 seconds in, we're down by more than 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.2. More warnings from corporate America. Here's another one from Qualcomm telling investors the following. The softening macroeconomic environment and sustained COVID restrictions in China have led to broad-based demand weakening on the West Coast. Let's get to Ed Ludlow. Morning, Ed.
Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. We're down more than 7.5% on Qualcomm. Biggest drop since June. Biggest drag, of course, on the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, which is down 1.7% itself. There's two things happening here with Qualcomm. First, as you said, demand for handsets, and Qualcomm is the biggest maker of smartphone processors and modems for the iPhone, it is dropping off a cliff, right? Previously, Qualcomm had guided that handset shipments would drop by single digits in full year calendar 22. They've changed that guidance to say it will be low double digits in terms of the drop in handset shipments. The other thing is that inventories are now an issue. We've changed the story in the semiconductor space completely. COVID restrictions in China and that weakening macroeconomic condition globally means that you have increasing supply and lower demand, which means that there's eight to 10 weeks of inventory for Qualcomm's customers. Instead of ordering more chips, they're waiting to whittle down those inventories. Qualcomm emphasizing this is short term. They expect it to take a couple of quarters to work that out. But how quickly has that story changed, John, from the beginning of this year, where we were supply constrained and demand was intense? There was a shortage of specific chips. This was a record quarter in terms of revenue just gone for Qualcomm. That's worth pointing out. And there was another win. Previously, they expected to build around 20% of the modems for the 2023 iPhone handset. They're now expecting to build the majority of those modems. Why is that important? It's an interesting point that Apple seems to be struggling to do this part of their business in-house. A win for Qualcomm. It's not helping the shares, but really the macroeconomic readout is what's important here. The stock down by more than 7%. I talked about the bond market taking a chunk out of the FX market, out of the euro, out of sterling. And it's taken a chunk out of the labor force on the West Coast. Stripe, here's the headline yes. from them moments ago, cutting staff by 14%. It's readying for what they call leaner times. The co-founder said this, we were much too optimistic about the internet company's near-term growth in 22, 23, and underestimated both the likelihood and impact of a broader slowdown. Ed, they are not alone, are they? They're not alone. You look especially across some of the larger uh, growth names in in the private company space, Instacart, including in that, they are battening down the hatches for what is a changing market. Uh, Stripe was pretty bloated, right? I think we started the year at 8,000 employees. We're now going back to 7,000, uh, a cut of 1,000. But uh, what I'm hearing from venture capitalists on all uh, levels of the curve, from seed through to growth equity stage, is now is the time to be disciplined. Preserve cash. Do not invest uh, with risk and be conservative with hiring. And that is exactly what this Stripe story represents that's crossed the Bloomberg. Hey, Ed, thank you, buddy. Great coverage, as always. About three or four minutes into this, the equity market's down by a little more than 1%. You break down the industry grouping on the Bloomberg. Every single group right now on my screen is in the red and negative. Consumer discretionary with some relative outperformance, believe it or not, down just a third of 1%. Energy down by about six-tenths of 1%. Financials, bottom of the pile, off the back of the bond market, move curious. Financials down by 1.35%. Information technology down by 1.25%. Real estate down by 1%. Utilities off by 9 tenths. Industrials down by 8 tenths. Take your pick. It's down on the session. More punishment for earnings misses. Seems to be the theme so far in earnings season. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo said this. The third quarter is on track for a new record for harshest EPS miss penalties. While this is a risk... There have also been opportunities for larger rewards. Chris, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Chris, lovely to catch up with you, mate, as always. Let's start with the corporate numbers. What are you learning so far from this earnings season, Chris? Uh, what we're learning so far from the, this earnings season is what you would expect. It's, it's becoming more and more difficult to beat. If you are beating, the market is rewarding you. But if you're missing, the market's really penalizing. You're not going to get saved out by the economy. You're not going to get saved out by the Fed. And if you can't turn things around, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse, which leads us to why we've been pushing momentum, momentum strategies for so long, right? The things that are not working will continue not to work. And the things that are working will do better, right? And, and that's not a very exciting or sexy comment, but that's where we are. It's a very robust comment, and it, it's what we're seeing in the marketplace. Chris, how much has this assessment been skewed by big tech and single names, the likes of Meta, Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet? Right. So, so obviously those names, they, they make the headlines, and, and we see that. But we're seeing this across the board. The only place where we're really seeing a different kind of reaction is across momentum stocks. And when we look at momentum stocks, you get a much better reaction from your higher momentum stocks and you get a much worse reaction from your lower momentum stocks. But to answer the original question, you're getting those big headline stocks 
um, really miss and come down. But you're seeing this across the board. This is not something that's just specific to larger cap. It's just highlighted a lot more than 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 it is for the mid and smaller cap stocks. And Chris, we've all had trouble trying to work out when the real weakness from this turn down in the global economy is going to come about. You and I have had that conversation. Would it be Q1 of 2023? Would it be the back end of 2022? Chris, just on the pace of the downturn in corporate earnings, the weakness you're expecting to see, is it coming in quicker than expected or slower than expected? I think it's really coming in line with our expectations. So we didn't expect numbers to come down dramatically this quarter. We think numbers will come down dramatically next year because the underlying fundamentals are still OK. You're seeing the cracks. You're seeing certain companies do better, certain companies do worse. But it's not a terrible environment, right? You know, let's take a step back. What's happening in the broader market? The broader market's down 20 percent. Why is the broader, down, broader market down 20 percent? It's because the cost of capital is more than doubled. It's not because the fundamentals elicit a 20 percent down. If you go back to 08, we had Bear Stearns, we had Freddie, we had Fannie, we had Lehman go belly up. That's not what you're seeing on the fundamental side. What you're seeing is a cost of capital issue. But at the end of the day, what we worry about is those fundamentals will roll over next year. Numbers do have to come down. And, and that's when things get even sloppier. This is what Bob Michael at J.P. Morgan said 24 hours ago on this program, literally 24 hours ago to the second. He said this might be, Chris, the calm before the storm. Do you agree? It, it, thing, I, I do think things are going to get worse. Uh, as you point out, the front end of the curve, rates are going higher. The Fed is telling you that rates are going to go higher. The Fed, the, the big comment for us yesterday was, hey, it's going to, the, the penalty for over-tightening is much less than the penalty for going too slow. Now, they didn't say that specifically, but that's the message we took away. And that's what the market really didn't like. And so is it the calm in front of the storm? Let's just say things are going to get tougher uh, in the first half of next year on a fundamental basis. And the Fed, what is the, what is the Fed doing? What is the Fed saying? Hey, we can't crack the job market. We have a inflation problem. So we, we're still going to raise rates until either the job market cracks or inflation comes down. And again, that's not great for risk product. They couldn't have been clearer. Chairman Powell said the path to a soft landing has got narrower. He said that since the last meeting, the terminal rate probably has to shift higher. He built on that. I'm going to build on the words you just said, Chris, your takeaway, not off the mark. He doubled down on it more than once. I think he went about five times on it. He talked about the risk of doing too little, outweighing the risk of doing too more. The risk was asymmetric. Chris, with all of that in mind, I've asked this question a few times this morning. I want to ask the same question of you. If you're long this equity market right now, are you fighting this Fed? Oh, yeah, you're, you're definitely fighting the Fed. So, so what happened last year and what's been happening over the last couple of years? The cost of capital, the Fed brought down the cost of capital to a level that it never should have been. Right? The real rates were negative 100 basis points not that long ago. So they subsidized the cost of capital. What would you expect to see? You would expect financial prices, real prices, tangible prices to go higher. You bring the cost of capital back up, well, you need to adjust price. right? So prices need to come down. And that's what we're seeing. Now, what's also going to occur is you're going to slow down the economy. So now it's not just a cost of capital adjustment. It's a cost of capital and a fundamental adjustment, which is coming up. And th that's just a tough environment to, to invest in. So, yeah, you're absolutely positively fighting the Fed if you're on the market. Chris, so just a final question for me. I want to gauge from you and your team and the conversations you're having with clients right now as to whether you truly believe the reaction function of this Federal Reserve. I've heard some people call this guy at the Federal Reserve, this chairman, a dove in hawk's clothing. But ultimately, when times get tough, he'll back away. Do you believe that we could get a recession next year in the United States and this Fed would not cut interest rates? Um, John, that, that, that's a really good question. And, and, and what I would say is this is a Fed that's really difficult for us to handicap. The, the, the Yellen Fed, the Bernanke Fed, the, the Greenspan Fed was a lot easier to understand and handicap. This one's a lot more difficult. And, and so I, I don't know the answer to that. And the other question that we're, we're, we're talking about is, hey, what's driving inflation and what's interest rate sensitive and what's not? OK, are we fighting old or equivalent rent? Are we fighting commodity prices? Are we fighting wages? Because each one has a different interest rate sensitivity and raising rates may not be the best solution for these things. And so they probably do have to go too far. But to answer your original question, it's really tough to handicap them because I'm not sure exactly what drives them and, and what makes them tick. It's tremendously difficult. Chris, 
Wonderful to catch up, buddy. We'll catch up soon before year end, I'm sure. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Equities down nine tenths on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're down about one full percentage point off the back of the moves in the bond market, up 10 basis points to the front end. That move fades just a little bit, but still up nine or 10 basis points. Quite a move and building on the gains of yesterday. 472 on twos, on tens, 418-ish. Up seven or eight basis points off the back of that. Guess what? Dollar stronger against pretty much every single currency in G10 right now. Coming up, it's the home stretch ahead of the midterms. There are candidates running for every level of office in America. This is a path to chaos in America. That conversation still ahead. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England. That's at 12 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. London. This is Bloomberg. As I stand here today, there are candidates running for every level of office in America, for governor, Congress, Attorney General, Secretary of State, who won't commit, they will not commit to accepting the results of elections that they're running in. This is a path to chaos in America. It's unprecedented. It's unlawful. And it's un-American. President Biden ramping up the rhetoric ahead of midterms. The GOP pushing back. Leader McCarthy tweeting, President Biden is trying to divide and deflect because he can't talk about his policies that have driven up the cost of living. All of this is Fed Chair Jay Powell raising rates yet again despite Democratic pushback. The White House still taking the Fed's side. The Fed uh, is an independent agency, and we respect their independence. Uh, the Fed actions help bring inflation down, stable and steady growth with lower inflation. This is the kind of economy that delivers for working families, and that's how we see uh, the work of the, of the Fed. The team coverage starts right now with AMH down in D.C. Mike McKee with us here in New York. Morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, John. What you just heard there from the president's press secretary, we just heard as well from his chief of staff, Ron Klain, saying here at the White House, he was asked directly about the Fed from MSNBC, and he said here at the White House, we don't comment on monetary policy. The issue this White House is facing, of course, Jonathan, is really twofold. One is the midterm elections, where the economy is front and center. You see that with this latest Wall Street Journal poll today. Uh, the numbers are getting worse, especially for a robust voting group like suburban white women. They are now leaning towards Republicans just because it costs more to live every day. And the second is the fact that this White House doesn't want to comment about the Fed, but members of their own party do. And we see a growing chorus of Democrats really taking aim at Fed Chair Jay Powell about this aggressive hiking and what that could potentially mean for the future of the economy. Mike McKee, in that news conference yesterday, after all these questions being asked by Democratic senators, do you think the chairman answered those questions or fueled the fire? probably fueled the fire a little bit because he said we're going to continue raising interest rates and the politicians don't like that, especially when it's a week before the election. It's interesting, under the Trump administration, the idea that the administration did not talk about the Fed went out the window. What will happen if Republicans take one of those houses back? Well, they're going to complain about what the Fed's done for recession and inflation because that's what politicians do. But there are some questions about the Fed's dual mandate. Should they focus on price stability only? They may look into bank capital requirements. Some members of uh, the Republican Party don't like the idea that the Fed's raised capital requirements. Uh, there is a possible Fed ethics probe. The chairman was asked about that yesterday. And then rules around central bank digital currency are probably going to be coming up in the next few years, and they will want input into that. Biggest thing, of course, that's going to be coming up soon the debt limit, uh, the speaker to be perhaps uh, does not want uh, wants to hold the economy hostage to get spending cuts out of President Biden, uh, but the incoming head of the F banking and finance committee, Patrick McHenry, does not. So it'll be interesting to see how that dynamic plays out. Fed is going to kind of ignore it all unless perhaps we do violate the debt limit. And Marie, we all know the probabilities, but we've only really discussed one outcome and that's a red wave or maybe a divided Congress. MH, what happens if we get a blue wave? What's on the table next for this administration if they get what they'd love to see, which many people doubt they'll get to see? 
Well, it's interesting because their major big ticket landmark items they wanted to get done, they have. They had the Reflation Reduction Act, which is very little version of Build Back Better. This was a huge effort from the administration in the first year. They were able to get hard infrastructure done alongside Republicans uh, two summers ago. So they were able to get a number of things, as well as the Semiconductor Chips Act. So they were able to get all this done, also likely with an expectation that history does say that in most midterm elections, it's a referendum on those in charge, and usually the president's party doesn't fare well. What I would have been focused on for next year, Jonathan, and this is off of another Wall Street Journal report, poll this morning, is what about the foreign policy and the international money, right? Because that is something that this administration continues to tell its friends and partners, the Ukrainians, that that will continue to flow. But we've already heard, um, you know, from some Republicans saying there's not going to be a, quote, blank check. And in this poll, it does seem to reflect that. It's slowly becoming a partisan issue. You mentioned the White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain, speaking on MSNBC a little bit earlier this morning. He said the United States is not in recession. Mike McKee, a lot of economists will agree with that assessment because the labor market hasn't broken down. And the Federal Reserve has the support of this White House for now. And I say for now, Mike, because it hasn't been tested yet. If we see this labor market break down, do we have a different approach? I don't think so. I think the Democrats have internalized the idea of you don't criticize the Fed. Uh, you let the Fed do its job, and that's why it was set up as an independent agency. Republicans, obviously, uh, in the last administration went a different way. So uh, we've got two more years, at least, of Joe Biden, and I don't think you'll see a lot of pressure out of the White House. There may be some behind the scenes. Joe Biden may have Jay Powell over to lunch, but uh, Powell is now uh, in his uh, second term, and so he's not going anywhere. And I think uh, the White House knows it can't do much about changing the Fed's mind. Mike, let's talk about the data briefly. The S&P down by 1.26%. On the Nasdaq, we're down by 1.4%. We had the PMIs out moments ago. I believe we get the ISM services index at the top of the hour. Yeah, the uh, PMIs come in a little bit stronger for services and for composite, but they're still under 50. The uh, services number at 47.8 and the composite number at 48.2. So we do see some signs of contraction in those S&P PMIs. The services PMI from ISM is going to be really interesting because uh, that's been the strongest part of the economy. We did see a big drop in prices paid in the ISM manufacturing index. So let's see if on the services side, inflation is still holding up. That's what Powell was talking about yesterday. What a negative 24 hours. Mike McKean, great work at a press conference. Had a ton of messages about that. Just wonderful, as always. AMH down in D.C. Amory, thank you, as always. The run into the midterms within a week. A week from today, we get CPI in America. Don't lose sight of that. November 10th. And then the next print is December 13th. And that's about a day away from the next Fed decision. So I think we're at the mercy of that. Until then, it's an equity market that trades lower, softer, negative. We're down by 1.4% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about 1.5% plus. Let's get you some sector price action. Here's Abby. Well, John, with that bearish action, with the S&P 500 and the other indexes down four days in a row, at this point, we're looking at a down week, the worst week since June. Not surprisingly, most sectors are lower. There's only one that's higher. That's energy, which is kind of curious, only because we do have oil down. But that, of course, has been the safe haven, quote unquote, safe haven sector all year long last year, where there's nowhere else to hide. Investors going there. But to your point on uh, the bearishness for technology, tech down 2.5%, communication services, some of those other mega cap techs down 1.6%. Financials, even with yields down 1.5%. Many of these sectors down 1%. What I really want to highlight, though, is we do, of course, have this other uh, pocket of weakness. That is China tech. Now, on a relative basis today, it's not down so much. It's down about 1%. But over the last two months, that NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index down 33% in just two months. That's not even uh, the peak to trough decline. That's closer to 35%. But take a look at the NICE Fang Index, which has some of those China tech ADRs down 20%. And then the the Nasdaq over this time period down 11 percent. So it's felt like we've been in this rebound rally. But when we break it down this way, John, I don't know. This year's bear market still seems to be in play. Brutal, I think, is the word I've maybe overused this year. But brutal. Abby, thank you. Yields up, stocks down. I've said that how many times through 2022? I'm going to say it again. Yields up, stocks down on the S&P by 1.4 percent on a two-year up 10 basis points to 472. Coming up, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Negative follow through post Fed and into Thursday. Equities down by 1.4%, down by 1.8% on the Nasdaq. Yields higher, Treasuries lower. Look at the moves at the front end of the yield curve on a two year right now, up about 10 basis points or so, 472 on twos. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. ISM services data at the top of the hour. President Biden discussing student debt relief at 345 Eastern Time. Fed speak returns on Friday. Boston Fed President Susan Collins scheduled to speak. And finally, we close out the week with the payrolls report. Right now, the estimate in our survey is at about 200k. Fantastic lineup for you tomorrow, as always on this program. Looking forward to catching up with Rick Reader, with Anastasia Ramoroso, with Mike Collins, and we should hear from the White House first on this program. We'll catch up with the Labour Secretary. Looking forward to that too. From New York, good luck for the rest of the trading day. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.